Okay, thank you. That's Dave Woodard. I really appreciate it, Dave. Uh, he helps get the uh, the show started here. And my thought when I hear that news is uh, saddened to hear that uh, after the police spent a day looking for people to help, um, there's another shooting. So obviously the gangs uh, were not uh, listening, if you will, and or perhaps they were listening and sending their own message. And so we'll come back to that uh, later uh, in the show. And we're going to be joined uh, by Ross McLean, who's a friend of the show, and he's in studio with me, and he'll help us get through the uh, you know, the day's events. If you'd like to call, 416-872-1010, star talk 8255 on your cell, 71010 uh, is your is to text us. And um, now we're joined, uh, just because she's calling in all the way from Nigeria, uh, Kemi, uh, Miss Kemi, welcome. I know you're deported, but you're here on the late shift. Joe. Joe, I'm going to call back in five seconds because we're going to cut off on this line. I'm going to call back in Okay, the well, show. that's called call back. Five call, seconds. Call back. It's and, 3 a.m. here. Okay, call back and, Ro- and Ross. Okay, I'm uh, going to call back right in five seconds. Okay, thank you. Ross uh, McLean, you heard, uh, welcome back to the late shift, first of all. Great, Joe. Thanks for being here. It's good to have you here. And, um, you know, the thing is, Ross, uh, you were uh, a member of Toronto Police, and, and we want to reintroduce you, and you obviously... Has, have worked a lot in security, and we're going to have you talk about the uh, different things that happened today. But the first thing I want you to react to is the report that Dave Woodard uh, just gave us that there's another shooting tonight. And he used the word grazed the head, and I, I suspect that came from police or reports, but that also could mean that's a gunshot to the head, isn't it? Yeah, that's a gunshot to the head, Joe. Not only that, though, a graze to the head is about three inches from being the next homicide count. Uh, on the day for 2012. That's how close But no one, one will was. talk about this shooting because it wasn't a homicide. It, it may go on the, the numbers. I don't even know if they really go on and if they keep proper stats or not. I don't think they do. I, I, I counted way more shootings than are on those stats. But um, but there it is. I mean, this is the response uh, to the gangland world, I guess, uh, to what we saw today. Well, what we are seeing is gangland world. Make no uh, mistake about it. You're, you know, you almost need to hand out programs now, now to figure out who the players are, Joe. Uh, you look at different areas of the city, different geographies. Some of them are, are owned by the Bloods or Blood-related gangs. Some of them are, own, are owned by the Crips or Crip-related gangs. Uh, so we need to know who the players are and who's shooting who. All I've heard on this station uh, this morning and tonight is uh, people uh, with excuses and apologies and, and they don't want to offend uh, Chief Blair or the police as if you know, somehow that there's some sort of special relationship and maybe, uh, I, I just don't get it. When Why don't we talk about what the hell is really happening here? We do it on the show every week here on The Late Shift. And uh, and, and look at this, this shooting here. I've got a report here from Terry Davidson, my colleague at the Toronto Sun, and he's talking, he's interviewed, you can read this on torontosun.com. I just got it now, Justin printed it for me. And it says uh, that... A woman he interviews named Mary, she didn't want to give her last name, I guess not, lives right across the street from the shooting. She described both the victim uh, and the shooter as black. I thought he was going to collapse, she said to the victim. Uh, She said, I've been here since 1973 and shootings and robberies happened, but it's been quiet lately. And she described uh, the uh, victim as 18 years old and uh, there was a shooting, three loud pops, and a car ran off a uh, dark blue sedan, and somebody was running down the street bleeding. And uh, there's your Toronto. There's your Toronto in uh, 2012. And it's okay with people. It's okay with uh, with all kinds of people that will criticize uh, people for telling it as it is. When that damn well happened tonight, and it's not acceptable to me. And uh, if you want to join the conversation, 416-872-1010. And uh, you know what? Let's call for witnesses uh, to come and testify against the latest shooting. And I know that no one gives a damn about the victim either because the victim, if the bullet had missed the victim and hit something and then hit an innocent victim, then we care, you know. But we should care because it could have happened. And these young people, we don't even know who the victim is. We don't know what the message is. Is that them, Ross, responding to the police's, uh, what I consider a pathetic performance today? I mean, for them to get up in front of the city and basically shame and guilt the public to help them and say, oh, well, you know, it's up to you to get in the stand, in, in the box, like I say, like uh, like uh, Kenneth Mark did, get in the box and he's in a pine box. Uh, 
Come on. I mean, uh, this is, un- is this what it's happening here? Basically, they throw their hands up and say, there's nothing we can do. And I don't mean to blame just the police because I'll tell you, that lightweight Premier McGinty under his regime has allowed a catch and release program. The police have caught most of these people, been put before the courts. Most of them are on uh, house arrest. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. The government should fall, and we need new thinking. And nobody gives a damn. They spend the whole day on this station uh, kissing the butt and not wanting to offend people instead of telling us it is. I, I'm really, really ticked off. 416-872-1010. If Kemi calls back, we'll take her call. Ross, uh, you can tell him I'm a little fired up. Well, I mean, you should be, Joe. The last time we were on here and discussing this back after the Danzig shooting, uh, the problem there, the question I had for you was, who really is in charge of taking charge of the gang problem, the gang violence problem in the city? You know, we just had the meeting, you know, the summit of the gun with the premier, uh, his two his two attorney and solicitor generals, the mayor and the chief. Uh, the police board wasn't there, of course. They they couldn't make the meeting or they weren't invited to the meeting. Uh, or later, neither was the, the association. They should have been there. Everybody, you know what? We need a leader in this, and the one point that you're making is right. It's not just the police department's fault. The police department no. plays a role in it, and you're absolutely right. The courts play a role in this. The jails play a I role in this. I read this editorial in the Toronto Star this summer, and I, you know, I love the Toronto Star. I read it, and it was quoting Mark Pugash, who was the spokesperson, and we we tease, we call him Chief Pugash, and he does a, a stellar job, really. Uh, being the spin guy for the chief. I mean, he really does do a good job at that. But in this, he tried to sell this bill of goods. That, no, 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 no. All these crazy numbers that uh, the summer of the gun, uh, the the same kind or worse numbers that we saw before, really not anything, any big deal, just people shooting into cars, no, uh, no big deal. And he was wrong. He was wrong. And all the people that went with him were wrong. And the real reason that I mention it is I don't want to be right about this, and I don't think that Adam Vaughn wanted to be right about it or Pam McConnell. The mayor was also wrong on it. It's the fact is that if they had done the patrols, uh, the extra patrols, uh, then maybe a Danzig, is it Danzig Street or Avenue? I've seen it written both ways, but uh, the Danzig party issue, I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened, but it would have been nice uh, had somebody taken the gang situation seriously and who knows what would happen, but I'll tell you something, Joshua Yasse and Cheyenne Charles are two of the victims, and there's other victims there that did live, that really, you know what, um, I just don't think that you can gloss it off and say, well, some reporter that, that told the truth about what the numbers really are is an idiot and ridiculous, when in fact it's the other way around, that the people didn't do their jobs, and they're going to get to keep their jobs, and not only that, they're going to say, sit down, shut up, and we'll also fix it, when we know they're not going to fix it, they're incompetent. And you know what, if you are okay with that in this city, then just go along with it and wait till the bullet goes through your uh, kid's window or your window, and uh, and then uh, give us a call if you live through it. Dave in Toronto, welcome to The Late Shift. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, uh, you know, I'm very calm about this. You, you fill us in on, yeah. on your thoughts on it, Dave. Well, two things I wanted to sort of touch on. One is, I was listening to Jerry Agar this morning. And a police officer came on the show after the interview was done, and he basically said these guys running around with guns are fools. And I I just want to say, if they are fools and the police can't catch them, what does that make the police? And uh, number two, I wanted to say that John Philip Garrison, the Attorney General of Ontario, has not stepped up, not said a thing, not done anything to change justice of the peace with regards to bail. The, The McGinty government is just a failed government, and I don't understand how we have them in office. Yeah, well, we have them in office because we had a by-election. We could have sent that message. People have their heads in the sand. They don't care about it until it affects them. But you're absolutely right. And, and he, ra- Dave raises an excellent point, Ross, and that if these guys are such fools, then why is it that we can't catch them and keep them in prison? Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, you can call them fools, but they're fools like, uh, fools like a fox or crazy like a rat. I mean... Uh, they have more money than we have because they're running drugs. And, you know, oh, even today... Uh, uh, Post all this stuff, people are saying, oh, we're not sure if it's gangs. We, you know, is it really gangs or just people with a beef? Give me a break, man. Uh, give your head a shake, people. I mean, it, it is what it is. And stop trying to spin it. Dave, I really appreciate the call. And no I would, problem. I, I, uh, I would like to keep you longer, but I've, I've got to grab Cammy here. She's uh, no calling problem. from I Nigeria. Understand. You guys have yeah. a great night. You too. Thank you, Dave. And uh, P- Peter and Renford, you hang on. We'll get to you. And a recommendation to Police Chief Bill Blair, tell your people, well, tell yourself and your people to stop playing down the street gang problem in the city. 
We've got G. Way and Malvern and Shower Posse and Crips and Bloods and on and on and on and on. Gangs with roots going back to several countries around the world. Just because there are only three or four people in some of those gangs doesn't mean we don't have a gang problem. Well said, uh, Dave Agar, this morning uh, on uh, More in the Morning. And uh, I, I heard that clip live, and I heard a lot of other stuff uh, on More in the Morning live, and uh, Jerry Agar was fantastic. And there's other people on the morning show that have their heads in the sand and don't have a clue and are uh, opting and vying for getting one of those uh, awards you get, like an uh, honorary detective, that kind of thing. You get in good with the police, and you just... Uh, talk about uh, how great they are and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, you know, I've been there myself, and I guess I won't be getting one of those awards. But we may try to save lives. If the police today, when they had their uh, uh, news conference, and basically, uh, you know, basically guilted the public into, I guess, help them. I, I don't, I don't know what they're supposed to do. Why they can't uh, find other ways? But you know, why didn't they offer something along the lines of a? a reward or a witness protection program. I guess it's not all the police that have to do that, but why didn't the province and, and the mayor and everybody sit down and say, look, we've got a million dollars here. Let's catch these guys. They're laughing. The gangsters are laughing at them, and it's really embarrassing. And, you know, it's too bad because real good co- guys and real good cops. In fact, here's a quote here from, um, well, let, before we do that, let's take some calls here. People have been waiting patiently Let's start uh, with uh, uh, George in uh, Markham. Welcome to the late shift. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Welcome. You're on. You're on uh, here on the late shift, George. Good can, evening, sir. Can you hear me, George? George, are you there? Did we lose George? Okay. Let's uh, help me out here, Justin. With these, I'm a little uh, hot here, and I'm hit, hitting the wrong buttons. Let's go to Irene and Don Mills. Irene, welcome to the late shift. I, um, the day after the shootings on Danzig Street, Jerry Agar had a caller who said that she had had a block party a week prior to that one. She had actually filed for a permit to do so, and the community policing unit attended her party. Uh, they helped her with everything. They brought trinkets for the kids and let them play in the police car, etc. So I'm wondering, on the day of the Danzig party, when the police were called out several times for noise violations and other complaints, um, why they didn't either bust the party because it was illegally being held, or why they didn't stay and police it like they had done at the party that was actually permitted with, through a permit to do so. Maybe they were at TIFF. Maybe they were, you know. <laughs> I mean, no you know, I, again, uh, you're not going to get one of those detective, uh, honorary detective uh, medals at the end of your your call. But, uh, you know what, it's a fair question. Now, again, if we were Monday morning quarterbacking, as people accused me of doing today, It'd be one thing, but uh, Ross, uh, you know yourself that in uh, April, when the 12-year-old was found with the gun, that's when I did the search of the numbers and wrote that there's an alarming uh, trend of gun violence, uh, victims, and occurrences. And there was other columns ahead of that, including the Eaton Center. So, you know, they they just, uh, the leadership and people within it, I'm not talking about the investigators because they they were well aware and guns and gangs were aware, but I think that there was an overriding lack of understanding of what exactly was happening in the city, gang-wise. Yeah, well, what you're seeing, Joe, I think is the same sort of problems we've seen before, where the people who are in charge are not either not connecting the dots, or as Irene points out, perhaps not caring about connecting the dots. I mean, we've seen it before with the Jane Doe, the balcony rapes that went on before, where there was a, uh, just a series of rapes and sexual assaults going on in the city. And the police did not warn anybody, and Jane Doe suffered a rape and then sued the city for not being warned for being informed. You know, we saw it with the uh, killer colonel, Russell Williams, where we had break-ins and sexual assaults going on by the tens in neighborhoughts, and no one was warned about it. That's even though, not, in, not in Toronto, but uh, in other police jurisdictions. And, and the other one that, that comes to mind is Luca Magnata, where the guy from the States uh, phoned in, and he saw the actual murder online, and everybody was hanging up on him, including in Toronto. So, you know what? Uh, they've got to be better than that. I mean, we have to be better than that. And you're not allowed to criticize them, uh, Irene, or, or they get really ticked off. And yet, you know, you have to criticize them when you're dealing with dead uh, kids that uh, didn't have to be dead. So, yeah, uh, it, it, it seems like there's one set of rules for the law-abiding people and a whole other set of rules for the people Yeah, they kiss their butts, uh, politically correct. And they're afraid of their own shadows. And the whole day I heard on this, I mean, there's a lot of good radio today here on News Talk 1010. 
But, you know, uh, again, when they're criticizing me uh, on the morning show, they never seem to call me up and let me have a, a shot at explaining and asking them the questions about what they think about how wrong they've been all this year. And, uh, you know, and, and, and again, I, I have my own show, so I get a chance to do it here, and it's really great to have you, Irene, with us. Well, it's been bothering me for a few weeks, so thanks for letting me say that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Peter in Mississauga, welcome to The Late Shift. Oh, well, hey, Joe. Listen, um, I agree with you to, to some extent. Um, I think the cops need to, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've got the guns. They've, they're making a lot of money compared to other departments. I think they need to get out there and, uh, and uh, uh, like they did, the OPP did, when the bikers became a threat in, in, in the Toronto GTA area. I mean, they, they shut them down. Uh, so I'm not sure what's happening. What I disagree with you on is this hysteria. Uh, I, the sky is not falling. No, Joe. it is falling. It, it is falling. If you're Cheyenne Charles' family, it's falling. If you're Joshua Yase's family, it's falling. So don't give me that nonsense, Peter. You know what? Like, like, no, no, you're okay. You're okay with people. You're like the rest of them. You're okay with people dying. I'm not okay with it. And you know what? Until we get some hysteria here, we're not going to get any changes. Thank you for the call. Peter, uh, thank you for the call. George and Markham, I'm not going to listen to it. Uh, George and Markham, welcome to The Late Shift. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, something is bothering me. If the police know the, these gang members and they are walking around with guns, why can't they arrest them because they are walking around with guns? Instead of depending on people to come forward, people come forward, but they are not go, going to go understand and testify because they are afraid of themselves and their family. Well, you know, the, the cops have they have such a difficult time because they have to have warrants, they have to have reasons. If they pull people over, it's racial profiling. I mean, they, they really have a tough time with that, Ross. But can't. I mean, they know these guys, and they know that these guys and are And they also face getting shot, and too. And they harass them for walking around with a gun. No, but it's dangerous, weapon. too. But Ross, let, let Ross has carried the, you know, he's worked here with Toronto Police. Uh, maybe you can help us with this. It, uh, it's not an easy job uh, to do. You do have to have grounds. You just can't go around grabbing people. But to, to your point, caller, uh, the police absolutely know who these people are. Yes. Uh, there, there, there is absolutely no question in their mind who the bad guys are. And so, they're walking around with guns. Well, some of them are walking around with guns. Some of them have got 12-year-olds carrying the guns for them. Some of them have the guns, you know, that'll be placed within 50 yards of them, so if they need them, someone can run it to They them. have them in the car, like the, the guy involved in this last one this summer, the Eden Center guy, he was caught in Hamilton, there was a gun in his car, and oh, it wasn't his gun, so they just threw those charges out. So, you know, again, yeah, how do you blame yeah, police for that? that you blame was... the judge, and who is the judge? We don't know. We can't call that judge. That judge is no good. I'm a I mean, little surprised, If, if Joe. I blow it in, in this job, I could get fired here tonight. I don't give a damn because, you know what, if we're going to save lives, then let's talk about saving lives. We're going to take a break, and uh, when we come back, we'll take more calls, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to find more spin. I don't know. You're listening to The Late Shift on In-Depth Radio, News Talk 1010. These were a, a small group of young punks, approximately five to six people that were involved in the shooting. Uh, it's cowardice that they would do this in a group of over 100 and we need people to stand up, testify against these people, and that will result in a successful prosecution. Yeah, stand up uh, like Kenneth Mark did. He stood up and he testified and somebody shot him in the back uh, a bunch of times and he's dead. And the person that did it got six years, so that really, really scared them off. Uh, again, you know, not uh, Detective Sergeant Peter Trimble's fault, uh, but again, I, I don't understand... Uh, how the police can actually, with a straight face, c come out today and almost antagonize the uh, the gangsters uh, by calling them young punks and all this kind of stuff. When uh, again, uh, you know, we all feel that way, but the, it, it kind of like they must be sitting back, kind of realizing the power that they have, that they, you know, that they have no answer for them, and they have to kind of try to. Uh, you know what I mean, Ross? Like, uh, well, they, they see Joe that absolutely nothing is being done to stop them. They, they're they don't care if they get two years. In fact, the word is a badge of honor when they come out. So, I mean, what needs to happen now is we need to have a change in strategy here, Joe. I mean, they talk about witnesses coming forward, people coming out of the community, and as you say, almost trying to shame people in the community. Well, let me tell you something. I mean, I, I, I've worked as a police officer. I've been trained. I've taken adva advanced self-defense courses. I'm very good with weapons. I'm very good at disarming people with weapons. I've done close protection work with people who are chased by terrorists, Joe. 
And let me tell you, if I had to live in one of those neighborhoods and I was there on my own and I saw something and I had to live in that neighborhood and I had to come out and go tell the police, oh yeah, this is the guy that did it, this is the guy that shot them. I don't know that I'd, I'd really have to think about it myself because you have to watch your back 24-7 in your, in your home. Why, you know, why would they do what they did today? Well, here's a quote here from the other uh, detective, and he says, these shooters are small, weak, and cowardly. That's from Brett Nichol. Now, is that a strategy? I mean, maybe it makes him feel better. Maybe the public goes, oh, yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, he's not wrong there. But what does it mean? I, I mean, basically, it doesn't mean anything. I, I don't know what it means. Uh, you know, it's sort of getting a little uh, petty when you're calling them names and stuff and doing stuff. I guess it makes you feel better. What would make us all feel better is to see some solid arrests. But you know what, Joe? The thing we have to see more than arrests is arrests with convictions. I mean, we've seen a lot of these busts on these major gangs that go down, and we announce all the charges. A lot of them get tossed out when uh, court time comes. Well, that's the thing, you know, that I, I want to make the point is I'm trying to make a point here tonight. I have my show. I had to sit back and listen to all this all day long and keep my mouth shut. Nobody called oh. me. And and here is my show, and I have people like The Last Caller. I like Peter a lot. Uh, but, you know, they, they seem to be okay uh, and just say, well, look, the sky's not falling. Well, it's falling. It is falling if you are a family member of Yase family or of uh, the Charles family and many, many others. I, I, I got to tell you, in my time here in Toronto uh, as a reporter, uh, it's been about 20 plus years. And in that time, I've uh, covered about 500 or so homicides and I've been to the door and I still do that. And it's, it's not fun and it's very real. And I hear the same thing every time. Nobody uh, is fooling me. And, uh, and I don't think anybody's fooling you. You know, I, I do a lot of work on training uh, with women to prevent sexual assaults, show, And one of the things I tell them is I said, you know, I don't care what the stats are, if it's one in a hundred or one in a thousand. If you're the one that it happens to, it changes your life. And, you know, for these shootings that are going on, something that needs to be paid particular attention to about the shootings that are going on now and the trend in the shootings is the victims of the shootings. You know, it used to be everybody was kind of fine when it was gang member on gang member or biker on biker. But what we've seen now is people who are shot out of mistaken identity. They look like someone who's in a gang and they get gunned down by the other gang. And the bullets miss and they hit children, they hit infants, they hit women, they hit little girls, they hit wannabe guys who are going to be cops who are trying to do good things in the neighborhood. So it's not the bad people who are being taken out by these shootings anymore. It's the innocent people. Well, even today they mentioned that, that somebody that was uh, was killed was not uh, related at all in any way. So, you know what, we have an epidemic here. It's not okay. I guess if it doesn't hit your uh, own little world, that it, you, you know, some people don't care about it, but some people do care about it. Derek in Etobicoke, welcome to The Late Shift. Welcome, Derek. Hi. Um, as I was saying to you, Skull Greener, there's, uh, the, 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 resolving this issue is quite simple. It just takes some political will as well as some uh, in, in, uh, ingenious thinking on the police part. Uh, the first thing, you, are, you have to allow people in these neighborhoods. You, I mean, you've got to remember, these people are terrified, okay? They don't, they don't want to get hurt. They, they would like to see the violence stop, but they're afraid of these people, these thugs. So what you got to do, if I, from the police point of view, is you got to ha- allow these people to testify anonymously, not in court, never have to appear in court, just provide the information, and so long as the information corroborates with the investigation, and there, that's done. Number two, you got to... Uh, I'm sorry? No, just but let's let's take that point there. Stick with us, Derek. Ross, is that feasible? I mean, in, in a... It's supposed to be an open uh, court system, and uh, and people well, are guilty or uh, innocent until proven guilty, etc. Is it what he's suggesting? Hang on, let, let Ross answer, uh, Derek. Go ahead, Ross. Okay. Yeah, D- Derek has a good point. It's it's how you get to executing that point. Uh, he's right. We need to find a way so that people can testify without being terrified, worried about their lives, worried about the lives of their children and the rest of their family. And uh, there are ways to accomplish that, and it does require being a little bit ingenious. You'll and- never... You'll never get oh, away with an, you'll never get away with anonymous testimony, uh, well, but what you can what you what you can do is you can put in a viable witness protection and relocation program. The, prov- yeah, but- the province has one, and the federal government has one, and nobody, absolutely nobody, is utilizing it to bust up this gang issue. 
Well, the other thing, too, is uh, do we not use uh, anonymous tips and Crime Stopper? So what's the difference? No, you can take an anonymous tips, you can get warrants from tips, and you can go and you can probably arrest someone off of tips with some cooperation, but you can't convict them without... Oh, okay. uh, so that's, that's the problem. To convict, you need someone to say... Okay, but let's talk about something else. Uh, oh. that I've suggested, Derek, I like Derek's point in that I've called for before, and it's been covered here by News Talk 1010 in the past, about having a very well-funded snitch line. And Absolutely. it's so, some, something that's separate from the witness protection and people testifying, but just... To be able to call up a, p- a person like a Trimble and say, look, I was there, and, you know, let's talk about how much you can give me. Uh, what can you sit down and negotiate $100,000 or a million dollars? I don't give a, really a damn how much it is. I it mean, uh, what much. about that? It wouldn't even take that much. You, I mean, like, you start off even at $10,000. Yeah. And, I mean, can you imagine a 14, 15, 16-year-old being offered $10,000 cash, no string, and I mean cash, no paper trail, no nothing. Cash, so long as it, uh, there's a paper trail from the police to the, the person who received it so that there is no fraud. But just cash, it wouldn't take that much. The other thing we can, uh, we can do to this is that how often do I hear that police caught a victim who got shot by another gang rival, that person who got shot is well aware of who did what to them, and yet they take this pride in, well, I'm no snitch. Well, then you charge him. Obstruction of justice. What do you think well, of that, I mean, like, yeah. We have all these things on the docket. Why are we not using all these tools? I don't understand that. These are good questions. Yeah, no, they're great questions, and we need to have a bit of ingenuity here because what we've been doing is the same old story with these gang shootings and these uh, police response, and we're getting the same old answers, which is, Unsolved murders and homicides. Well, there's been about uh, you know several hundred unsolved murders uh, in the last ten or twelve years in my time here as a reporter for the Toronto Sun. It's it's astronomical the number. If you go on the website, you'll see all the names, and there those are names that are real people. Thank you, Derek. Uh, oh, J- oh, just one quick, one more quick one, guys. Real quick, because uh, there's people very, waiting. Very very quick. Uh, the other thing I would like to see is we need to drop this young offender thing from age seventeen down to thirteen. These kids are not. Stupid. In some cases, we I mean, really need to nip it in the butt. In some cases, I think he's right. Anyway, thank you. We'll get to the young offenders uh, stuff uh, at a different time. Jason in Toronto, welcome to the late shift on News Talk 1010. Oh hi. Uh, yeah, what I was calling about is um, my brother back last year. He was um, it was a home invasion of Mississauga. He was in bed, and some guys came into his house. He was shot, wow. and. Um, he he has uh, no record with the police, but he had. Um, but he, uh, I know from uh, experience with him, he's been harassed by the police an awful lot. So, um, so the police in in the description of what happened said, "Oh, the victim was known to police. Um, the people who came to his house were looking for drugs." The real story behind it was a person he, uh, his parents, uh, our parents worked with, um, their children. We, uh, he had my brother had a problem with them. It was a problem on the street. He beat him up. This guy was afraid to go and do anything to my brother directly, so what he did is go and uh, told some guys that my brother sold drugs, which he doesn't. He actually uh, doesn't do drugs himself. He's a professional fighter, like uh, like like. Um, this is like a complicated Mark. story here, man. What, what, uh, let's <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Well, let me get. I, I get to the key, the key part okay. of it. So he. So, anyways, um, now when he was shot, th- he was shot at chest level. Um, it, you can see through the wall because when he, when a guy aimed to shoot at him, when my brother fought back. Um, he jumped it. My brother jumped into his room, and then the bullet. Um, I guess somehow it went through uh, the wall uh, where his chest was, but it hit him in his uh, leg. It came in and out. My brother wa- um, wanted uh, wanted that. Um, well, oh, they actually charged the person with aggravated assault with a weapon when that should have been attempted murder. A, a, a kid ran over a cop, a cop's foot, and got charged with a, a, a attempted murder. And this guy came into my, um, our home, my my, my 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 parents' home, shot my brother. And it's, and and they charged the guy with aggravated assault. The guy, so my brother argued against it, and they still next next Friday, Friday the twenty first, is a sentencing. I don't I don't know if you guys can send out the news, your news crew or whatever. Well, you know what you know print. what uh, what I'd like you to do is email me the details, and we'll see if we can do that. Uh, thank you, Jason, uh, very much for the call, and uh, let's get Ross to comment on that. Uh, I think what he was getting at was that somehow because his brother had a connection, maybe. And something outside that it was lowered from an attempted murder to an aggravated assault. Well, here here's the problem with that. We see way too much plea bargaining uh, in cases. We see overcharging. 
uh, in cases. Like, I mean, it, uh, it drives me crazy when I see the uh, news releases from the police saying, uh, you know, two people arrested with 35 charges and they're all 35 different, you know, regulations and handgun charges. They're not going to charge them and take them to court on all 35. They're going to drop uh, 34 of them and have them plead to one. Uh, is what they're going to do. And quite often you get these charges that are lowered down to save the cost of doing the court and doing the thing. And people know that. They get away with uh, pleading to lesser offenses. And it's our way of streamlining the court and saving our money on jails. Thank you very much. Uh, Are we going to take a break here, uh, Justin? We got time for one more call? Okay, we got time for one more call. Bill and Whippy, welcome to The Late Shift. You know, I'm glad you freaked out on that last one guy, Joe, that Pete guy. About three years ago, a buddy of mine, off, just off Keel, was standing, just waiting for a bus, and saw three guys suspiciously kind of hanging around bushes behind the bus shelter, right? Next thing you know, so my buddy got out of the bus shelter, sort of walked. Next thing you know, there's a drive-by shooting. Glasses shot out. A couple guys have been hit. There's my buddy standing there. And the next day, we, we find out that someone was actually killed in the neighborhood. So this affects everybody in the city. So, so nobody should make light of any of the stuff like, oh, it only happens in that neighborhood. And what freaks me out is, Joe, I take that bus sometimes on the way to take a go bus. You know, it, it truly is something that people should take seriously in the city. Yeah. Well, you know, the other night, um, and I know, Ross, you were there as well. We were at the Rob Ford Blocko party, and uh, there was a lot of undercover police there, but... You know, with the threats on, on Mayor Ford and, the, you know, just the number, sheer volume of people there and everybody being invited, it crossed my mind that something like that could happen there. I'm glad it didn't, and the police did a great job of making sure perhaps that it didn't. But what if it did? Look, look at all the people there. And then and to, to, uh, to Bill's point, um, you know. Well, listen, Joe, one of the things people don't understand about bullets and guns is just how far they'll travel and just exactly what they'll go through and the damage that they'll that they'll um, do to your body if one uh, if one hits you, and Bill is absolutely right. Nobody should downplay this sort of thing. Nobody. Okay, uh, when we come back, we'll take a call here. Solo has been waiting uh, patiently. You're listening to In Depth Radio News Talk 1010. there's any consequence to their actions and you just have to look at their brazen activities like the Danzig shooting the center shooting and it actually like I say to the contrary that makes them more dangerous because they they don't they have no respect for anybody or anything Mike McCormick the um, Toronto Police Association uh, boss uh, on the situation today we're going to take a call in a second but uh, your comment uh, Ross McLean on uh, Mike's uh, comments his comment about that is fairly accurate. One of the things you're dealing with when you're dealing with young guys with guns, uh, with testosterone, uh, there's not a whole lot of reasoning with them. And uh, in the past, the ones that I've dealt with, um, you know, they don't respond to, it's very hard to get them to respond and pay attention. The only way you can get them to pay attention uh, is basically show them that 100% certain if they do what they're going to do, they are going to lose. That's about the only thing they listen to. Let's take a call here, Solo in Toronto. Welcome to the Late Shift. It's always good to hear from you. Hey, what's up, Joe? How are you guys? Doing great. Uh, I'm a little upset about this whole thing uh, because I'm just tired of people just kind of glossing it over, and we've got another body bag, and you heard the the whole thing today, Solo, with the police, uh, basically putting it on to the public, <laughs> saying, you stand up, you get in the box, and you testify against these people that we will not be able to really put away. They'll probably be on house arrest and out in six years. So uh, it's not an easy thing to ask of people, especially after the Kenneth Mark thing, where uh-huh. he did that and he's dead. Exactly. And uh, Joe, you know me. We've, we've talked a bunch of times yeah, here, back, back and forth. Tell so, me you your know, perspective. You, this is so your... my, my, my thing is this. I, it, it's pretty much... A lot of people are more focused on. I see the the what's his name? The representative McCormick. Well, it's his name. Yeah, Ma- Ma- Mike McCormick. He's the now, head of the Trump said, Police Association. Yeah, I get his point when he said that the more these kids get away with this, the more they are dangerous. The more they feel like they're invisible. The thing is, they became dangerous as soon as they started doing what they're doing. And the point that they are in their life is pretty much suicidal. They don't care if they're doing it in public. They don't care if they get seen. They're at a point in their life where it's pretty much 
you know, you can give them 25 years, you can give them a week to them. You know what I mean? Life is a dead end. Now, the only way to solve this problem is not to, to think about, okay, this is what we need to do when they commit uh, these kind of crimes. It's to avoid them. It's to prevent them from getting to that point, which is what we don't talk about. You know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, it, this issue has been divided in two. Instead of people talking about it in a way to solve it, like seriously solve it, it's become an issue, a topic where people pick side. Oh, the left pick this side, the right pick this side. When, when, when somebody does some stupid stuff like this, they start talking about immigration, they start talking about all kinds of issues. But the real cause of this is poverty. Okay, okay well, you let's... Can, you, uh, can, you can connect all the shootings. They all are connected. They all gang See, I don't... I don't are, it, so, hold, I mean, on a sec. hold on a second. Uh, stay with us. We've got another minute or so. I don't think the po- the poverty is an excuse. Like I, you know, there's so many stories of people that, in fact, there was just a senator that was made a senator who came on a boat from Vietnam in 1975 uh, to Ottawa, and he's a senator, and he had a very successful career, and he had nothing. He literally had nothing. Never even seen electricity before. That's a true story. And and so so hang on a second. Just be, we'll, we'll come back to you, but Ross, on uh, Solo's point, I mean, he's raising excellent points that we jumped immigration. We jump to uh, uh, race, kind of, uh, that kind yeah. of thing, and yet there's a bigger root cause problem. Yeah, so- Solo is hitting on a key point. I mean, and you're right, Joe. It's not about poverty. Poverty doesn't make you uh, violent or, or uh-huh. whatever. What Solo is talking about, and there is two sides to this. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, call it carrot and stick or whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh-huh. But Solo is right about one thing. If the kids feel they have no hope, that's when they're really dangerous. Okay, so yeah. last, last word to you, then we have to go to the news. So say it quick. What I think it is, uh, another thing you're talking about, which is very critical, it's the, the, the witness protection. Cops need to stop using people's evidence and, and going to the person and say, Joe, um, I'm, Mike said this about you, and so we are here to talk to you about it. You, if you go to somebody like that, nobody will ever come and give you information. Okay. So, you know what I mean? Uh, the, the, the witness protection is another key, key part. In no, Ireland. you're right. We're going to talk about that in the next hour when we come back on The Late Shift. Right now, time for Dave Woodard and News. Oh, be still my beating heart. What was that? Play that again. Go ahead. Oh, be still my beating heart. Let's raise a little hell tonight because that's exactly what we need to do, and... I know a lot of people think that there's nothing uh, that matters because it didn't affect them, but uh, there are reporters that have actually been to houses and dealt with dead uh, kids and things like that, and the ones that have done that, and the police officers like yourself, Ross, that have had to do that understand that the sky is falling when these things happen, and it's not like it just happened once and you could say there was one murder and it's a safe city and we've got the person that did it. In this case, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of murders, and hundreds and hundreds of murderers out there that we don't know how to get them and we we can't catch them and we you know we have no answer and we don't have any kind of you know, it's uh, you know we have to have you stand up and have the guts to get in the box and help us out when the people know that when the police are off their overtime when the extra uh, patrols are not you know no longer paid for that the gangsters are back in charge in the neighborhood so not fooling me um You know, let's take some calls here. My guest is Ross McLean, who's going to stick with us. I guess we're going to try to get through the hour on this issue because the phones are lighting up. Jason in Brampton, welcome to The Late Shift. Hi, yeah, thanks very much. I wish I had a silver bullet or a novel idea that could really knock this one out of the park. But And I, I really applaud the show. I think what it's going to come down to ultimately is that it's going to be a bit of a kind of like a slugfest solving this issue. It's going to take a long time, a lot of ideas. And a lot of the ideas that have been brought up so far are probably part of the solution, you know. If we look at um, opportunity, not just dealing with poverty, but equal, better opportunity scholarships and jobs and so on for people, younger people, um, you know, spreading, and this is a longer-term issue, spreading things out so people are not condensed so much where they're only seeing the worst role models, but, you know, working on housing so it's more spread out and we have more middle class mixed in with the lower 
Yeah, you know, up. and the guys on Friendly Fire before that, uh, Ryan and John, were talking about that, and I agree with that. Uh, I, the problem with that is that, and we've talked about it on the show, uh, Jason, before, uh-huh. is that when you do things like Regent Park, basically what's happened is they displaced everybody from there. And I, you yeah. know, and I, and I understand that we'd like to have everything perfect. It is public housing, but you could take the bad people. You know, I used to walk through Regent Park a lot and do a lot of. I've done a lot of stories. The old Regent Park, and it was ninety percent and probably higher of great people there. Very interesting people too, from around the world with backgrounds that are incredible. And yet, it was just the bad seeds in there. And it's, again, it's not the police's fault. They get them before the courts, and the courts uh, do the the old catch and release, but. Anyway, Ross, as, as Jason says, is there anything that can be done or all of the above? And, and you know, I don't see anybody really seriously looking at it. I mean, well, they're talking the, about everything but uh, solving one, it. One other thing also is, and I mean, part of it, somebody brought up immigration earlier, but oftentimes we want to blame Canadian society for this. But if, if people are coming from areas where there is very high levels of crime, it's only common sense that some of that is going to be duplicated. If there's, you know, not proper integration. Well, we got so, we, we managed to get Kemi kicked out of the country, and yet, you know, he raises a good point. I mean, uh, in the past, I don't know about the uh, gang warfare of today. I think that most of these gang people today, there are some that are coming in from the Somalia situation, and then, you know, there's many, many that are born here. Um, I guess some of that, uh, the, the deportation idea works in some cases, certainly letting people into the country with criminal records, they try to avoid it. We saw yeah. the thing with the, uh, the Rome, the Roma, uh, story, uh, you know, with a criminal gang issue that was brought in. So, you know, I think that all hands on deck, uh, is something that we need to consider. Yeah, there's all parts of it, and Jason raises. I mean, you know, the, the problem with this, you can spread, uh, you can spread it out so, uh, so much that it, uh, it disappears trying to find a solution to the problem. And one thing I said, we need in this, we need leadership, we need somebody to step up. The person in Ontario to do it needs to be uh, Mr. McGinty and his Attorney General and his Solicitor General, and they need to work with the federal government to, as Joe said before, start doing things like stemming the the flow of these guns. These are high-powered weapons that can fire off 20 bullets faster than I can say 20 bullets. And they're getting in here, and people are buying them, and people are using them. So, I've got know, a new idea. You know, actually, this just on that topic. Um, I was just calling about getting a firearm acquisition certificate yesterday. Um, there's both unrestricted and restricted licenses. And in speaking to one of the gentlemen who runs the, the courses, he no longer does the course for, un, for for sorry for restricted firearms. Those are the handguns. The reason being is because he found many of the clientele were not doing the course for the right reasons and weren't responsible. Didn't go into detail, but. The bottom line was that the people who run the courses that help people do the practical and, and the written test to get handguns, for example, restricted firearms, aren't able to make recommendations to the, uh, the police and others who actually have the final say in whether or not the, an individual gets licensed. And maybe that would be an improvement. If well, you, know, you, know, you know what, Jason, you're, you're, you're right about one thing. There's a problem with the way we give out uh, licenses and who deals with them and who manages them. I have to tell you, Joe, something that shocked me last year, uh, I think I sent information to you about it, was there was a civilian employee of the Toronto Police who was a gun dealer, and he was selling Glocks, and he lost a Glock that was being delivered to his house somehow, and he reported it lost. And the reason that they sort of found this out was because that Glock turned up later in the hands of a gang member. Uh, and, know, what, and what happened to that uh, member of Toronto Police? Nothing, because he was permitted to work as a gun dealer because they knew it. Thank you for uh, the call, Jason. Uh, before we t- callers, please uh, stick with us. 416-872-1010, star talk 8255, Texas at 71010. If you're listening out of town, one eight seven seven five one eight five one five one, and we'll take uh, the callers. But let's play uh, some clips that were uh, from earlier today. Want to do round one? Sure. It's not just Joe and Adam sitting around and saying, well, we know it's a big gang problem. Sure, did, and then they get vilified for saying what everybody get, knows. Yes, they did. They, they got mocked get, and, oh, these guys are being ridiculous. And they, they you were know, be, the, Joe was being ridiculous and still is. He ends his right. column today by saying almost gleefully, well, you know, I was right. Toronto remains a very dangerous city. 
he, you know, he did, he was vilified and he was beaten up and, and all of those things. So it, he, we give our, our columnists a lot of birth at the Toronto Sun and he has an opportunity to, to say what he feels he wants to say as, as he will tonight on News Talk 1010. Oh, but, uh, be still my beating heart, <laughs> I say again. I think well, we see, should, he gets I, vilified for saying something we should, much more straight than what we got from the police, for God's sake. We don't have to invent it every time it happens again, is my point. And Toronto remains, just as they said it was back then, a safe city. Uh, Justin will help me out. Who That was Jerry Agar and uh, Adrian Batra and someone else. I don't know. who. Was, oh, okay. Christy Blatchford. Um, Ross, I, and one thing I, I'll say about that is that every time that Christy Blatchford seems to have uh, a difference of opinion with me on this issue, it's always when I'm not on the air to uh, debate it or to talk about it. And, uh, you know, the last time this happened, they had an idea where I would go on and, and get a chance to kind of tell my side of it, and it would be good radio as well. We both are members of the team here. And, uh, you know, it didn't happen. To, uh, I was told that she didn't want to do it. Uh, she, I'm always glad to debate it. If you're going to be going on, a, and what she said was inaccurate, that I didn't say that I uh, gleefully uh, enjoyed uh, this at all. I pointed out what the numbers are, and in some cases it's a dangerous city. So I felt like, you know, I usually let it go, but... Um, I, I don't understand, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes you have to stand up for yourself. And I, it's been the fourth or fifth time that she's done it. She's wrong on this issue. And uh, and she looks uh, like, to me, uh, I think she's way off base, uh, certainly in the criticism of the column that I wrote today, which was the truth about where things are at. Well, the, you know, the facts certainly aren't on her side. And, you know, I read all the media to look to see how people are reporting things. And I remember when I worked on the job, Joe, I used to sometimes I'd be involved in an incident and I would read about it the next day in the paper. And in one paper, I didn't recognize the incident as the same one that I was in. And maybe in another paper, I would realize that they were reporting more of the facts that were going on. You know, so it's it, it's interesting people's different takes on it. But, you know, I, I followed her after the Eaton Street, uh, the Eaton Center shooting. And one of the comments that she made was she said that she thought the single, the single smartest statement she ever heard about guns in this city was this was only one idiot with a gun. And that was from Jeff McGuire, who at that time was the acting deputy chief, who's now the chief in Niagara Falls. Right. And what we've learned so far, and I don't think it even fooled anybody at the time, but certainly as the information came spilling out, we have a gang shooting, uh, gunshot, killing, murder, drug dealing, prostitution problem that's spilling over to all sorts of places. A problem with no answer. And so again, again, uh, she was wrong on that, and uh, instead of, uh, you know, talking about that, she's coming after talking about uh, Be Still My Heart, and it sounded personal. And it's not about her and I at all. It's about trying to save lives, and there's nobody that I've known in this business that cares more about that than she does. She does care, and I work with her for many years, and she does care about people. But I think what happens with, and this is an example of what happens when you get too close, and it's happened to me too in the past, when you, and then, you know, You don't want to tick off a Chief Blair. Now, uh, again, after G20, what happened, you know, I kind of got pushed over into one side. I felt I had to do the job that needed to be done. I think that I was uh, vindicated, if you will, if that's the right word, at the end of it with uh, the uh, chair, Alec Mukherjee's apology. Um, You know, I didn't need that uh, to feel that. It was tough to do because I like Bill Blair a lot, known him a long time. And I like, and I think he's a good man, but I don't think that he's always done a good job as chief of police. You know what, Joe? You don't get any better by people always rubbing you on the head and telling you you're a good little boy and that everything you do is right. Uh, and let me tell you, as a, as a former police officer and sitting at home watching uh, that G20, I was jumping out of my chair looking at the stuff that was going on in this city, and I could not believe the way it was being policed. And when people tried to gloss that over, uh, and I would talk to coppers that I know and people that I know, I'd say, look, what is going on here is wrong. The way this is being handled is wrong. This isn't the law. It's not the way that it's done. I'd have people look at me and say, oh, what are you talking about? You can't badmouth the police. I said, it's not badmouthing. It's about getting it right. You have to have the respect of the people. If you're going to police, you need people to respect you. If if Trust me, if you've got 500 people that hate you, they're not going to listen to you. Five hundred people who respect you, you can you can police that community. Well, it's a good point. Uh, you know, one of the things that I noticed uh, during that whole thing was that there seemed to be. I'm talking G20 now, but I mean, how does G20 relate 
to where we're at now. And I, I'm going to tell you what I think is that the police are up there today saying to the community, you risk your life. We're not going to protect you. We're not going to give you any incentive to do it. And after we leave, you're on your own. And yet during that whole thing with Ian Scott and the SIU, all we saw was dodge and weave and the blue wall of silence and people wouldn't tell the truth about who was in the picture, even though they were roommates and on and on and on. Well, there was, uh, look, there was a lot of spins, and the worst part about it was a lot of the lies that came out uh, from everybody. One of the, Possibly one of the worst ones that I saw was, uh, you know, it's not easy to say. We had, we had the chief involved in a lot of misstatements, mistruths, misspeakings. I'm not sure how many different ways he put the word salad on it to deal with it. Uh, we saw the, bat, the one with the weapons that were supposedly with the G20, and they weren't. We saw one uh, where the chief reported that uh, the repatriation of a body was disrupted, uh, you know, by protesters. And, uh, you know, Christy wrote about that. She interviewed the chief and she wrote that whole story saying that the protesters disrupted the repatriation of the body and it was printed that way. But you know what? The video came out after and there was absolutely nobody even near the repatriation of the body. So what it was, it was, it was trying to use the media to use the... Just just to bend public opinion without telling the truth. And you know what? We're really all better off telling the truth, Joe. I learned that early on in the job. You know, don't lie. Tell the truth. You never have to make stuff up or remember problems. Well, there were so many issues with that, uh, the G20, and, you know, that's behind us now. Now we're into something that's uh, perhaps even more serious and that I think that uh, the police have admitted it today that they don't really know how to go about getting these people in. They're murderous. They're involved in at least nine shootings. There are hundreds of people out there um, that, uh, you know, there's hundreds of unsolved cases. So in many instances, they're not safe. And actually, you know, by saying that they really want the people to come forward, you know, I wondered if that shooting tonight, uh, again, we, we're not going to be able to prove it with a press release from anybody, but it makes you wonder if that's not a message sent back saying, you know what, community, don't don't respond. This is what will happen if you do. Well, listen, that area where the shooting took place tonight uh, after our day of press conferences uh, was a border right between a Bloods neighborhood and a Crips neighborhood. I mean, that's where it happened. If you go back and you go Google shootings at uh, Jane and Wilson, you'll, you'll come up with pages of results over the years. Well, you rem- remember the chief on the night of the Danzig uh, situation said that they, you know, they don't have this kind of uh, incidents in Scarborough and it's the worst shooting of all time and all that kind of stuff. And I, I give him credit for having emotion that night, but he was, you know, he sounded like somebody that had never dealt with anything like this before when he'd been warned the whole summer about it. Well, I'll tell you the part that scares me about that is someone who looks at it. And I, and I consult with companies on dealing with their problems, Joe. When I had, when you see someone have a reaction like that, like the reaction was to the Danzig shooting and you're right, it was emotional and there's nothing wrong with the chief being emotional. You want him to, to some degree to be emotional about, you know, people being shot uh, and mass numbers in his city. But what it also tells me is it, it makes me wonder if he's shocked about it. If he's shocked about it, how did they not see this coming? I mean, you shouldn't be shocked about something like that happened. Even the caller right at the top of the show, uh, Irene, who called in, who said the police uh, went by this Danzig barbecue about three or four times and never did anything about it. And what we're left with now is we're left with a time now where all we do is Shootings happen, and then the police come in and respond, pick up the body, and we don't have witnesses. And you have some ideas on that, which we'll get to uh, later in the hour. Let's take a break, and all the callers, hang with us. We're going to take your calls when we come back on In-Depth Radio, News Talk 1010. I need people that are going to come to court and testify. It's actually even surprising that someone from Malvern would would venture down here or vice versa. Uh, That's just not uh, what should happen. Who do we have there? That was Trimble, uh, the homicide detective. Uh, he almost sounds lost. He's saying that they it's surprising that somebody went down here. They try to, curb, you know, get this all into neat uh, blocks and that. When it comes to the gangs, I don't even care about who is where and when and all that kind of stuff and whether they're a real gang. I heard that quote. We don't know if that constitutes that they're a real gang. You know, before I came to the show, I, I was writing my column, which you can read on torontosun.com about this issue. And I like these coppers, by the way. They're good coppers. But I called them out for what I thought, thought today was really an exercise in futility. And I was looking at my little nine-week-old son, and I'm saying to myself, what am I doing? Like, I'm just going to piss off all these uh, coppers, and I'm, 
upsetting people and the most important journalist in the world and Christie and going on and on and on. And then I thought, the reason that I'm doing it is because of my son, because it's someone else's son. And, you know, when Joshua Yase was killed, my son was just days old. And when I heard that name, it really did sink in there. You know, it, it really upset me because I know that he has a family uh, as well. And same with Cheyenne Charles and all the other hundreds of victims that I've covered over the years. So that's, uh, you know, why we do this show. And uh, I appreciate all the callers hanging with us. And we're going to try to get through them all. So I ask you all, when I get to you, just make your point and let's let's get through as many as we can. Peter, welcome uh, to The Late Shift. Okay, I'll be real quick, guys. Listen, a few days ago, there was a homeowner. He was a father. A homeowner comes home <clears throat> and finds an intruder. Somebody had broken into his home, hiding behind a door. He stabbed him. He's looking, not he, not the criminal, the father is looking at 14 years in prison. A witness was shot in the back by one of these thugs. He's looking at the guy who shot, the guy in the back, is looking at six years in prison, okay? Out in half that time. You know what? I long for the good old days when a person's home was their castle and when looters were shot on sight, all right? It's the justice system that's pathetic. No one's talking about that. It's not just the cops. I'm sure there's plenty of cops out there that are shaking their heads and oh, yeah. out in a pathetically low amount of time. You know the difference between us and the states? Judges are voted in in the states. A people are appointed. And they're just, they're, they're like ethereal things. Their names are never brought up. I want to know who some of these pathetic judges are as well. Okay, Peter, I don't think we need to respond. He said it so well. Thank you, Peter. Simone uh, in Parkdale, welcome to the Late Shift. Hi there. We have to get the Talitarian about this. We have to take these people, get them, out, throw them out of the city, send them out to, uh, you know, uh, uh, prisons. And way up north, as far as you can get it, as cold as you can get it, let the Inuit run the places. And if, if not, if not that, then exile them somewhere, where any place where any country will want them. I don't care if it's Zimbabwe, Somalia, China, the worst countries you can find. Okay, thank you, Simone. Thank you. Thank you Bye. very much. Okay. Um, Alan Rexdale, welcome to the Late Shift. Well, all this hand wringing and, and weeping and moaning and. Uh, it boils down to that you need cooperation from the people to turn around and deal with these gang members. It's really quite simple. As Jason knows, as he says, he's a former police officer. Uh, you testify in court, the first thing the defense lawyer says is, who are you, where do you live, and how do you know this person? And meanwhile, all the gang member buddies are sitting there in the courtroom, and they know who you are, where you live, and everything that goes with it. It's about time that we offered a better incentive to people that's come forward and that we uh, allow them to either do it anonymously or we provide the protection they need so that they're not intimidated or threatened afterwards. Uh, Al, excellent call, uh, and uh, we'll let Ross respond, and uh, then we'll take calls from John and Kelly. Go ahead, Ross. Yeah, he nails down an excellent point, but I'll tell you, Al, it's even earlier than that. You don't have to wait till the court time for the bad guys to find out who you are. The Crown has to give disclosure. So what happens, as soon as they have the evidence to take the statement from that witness, it has to get turned over to the defense lawyer. The defense lawyer goes and gives it to the gang member who's sitting in prison reading it. And they get to communicate the information out to their gang as exactly who is giving testimony. And I recognize disclosure, which was supposed to help the uh, prevent uh, uh, wrongful convictions and, and give the uh, accused every opportunity to defend himself. But we also have to recognize that because of the situation and the intimidation and the fact that a witness now can lose his life by stepping forward and doing the right thing, that we've got to turn around and offer that person more protection. And Al, it, Al, I could not agree with you and if more. And if it affects disclosure, so be it. Maybe disclosure will have to be amended to uh, person A and person B as opposed to John Bloggins or whatever. Thank well, you, you know, when it came to the Hells Angels, Joe, they went and built a huge special courtroom for, I think it was millions of dollars, just to accommodate the jurors so they could sit there and be protected while they were doing it. So, you know, our you know, country is not against spending the money to protect people. And another thing that uh, you mentioned about the bikers and Mike Bullard here today on his show, um, he, he raised an excellent point about the Danzig uh, situation and why the police didn't go in and, and shut it down when going down to Port Dover, all these people that are basically, you know, having fun with their motorcycles are cer certainly not gangsters. They're being pulled over all the way down there. Uh, that kind of thing, you know what I mean? And so why wouldn't they go in and, and, and do the same at this party and, and go after people that are breaking the rules there? 
everyone else that breaks the rules uh, gets pulled over. So why why didn't they do it at Danzig Street? Yeah, they could certainly put the pressure on a lot more on these places. And you know what? Still be reasonable about it. It doesn't mean that you have to assault people or do things wrong, but uh, I don't know why there wasn't a, ba- a bigger presence there once they saw what was going on. Okay. I, I mean, the police are already being sued, Joe, for that... Uh, that case earlier where there's a big party down on the lakeshore where they were trying to get rid of the kids and the one kid got hit by the bus. And yeah. the complaint there was that the police did not respond to the large crowd well enough. They didn't have a plan. And, and uh, you know, again, that one's a tough one because, uh, anyway, but that's a different issue. Uh, let's take uh, one more call before we take a break. Uh, John in Cabbage Town. Nick and Kelly, you hang on. We'll get back to you after the break. John, welcome to The Late Shift. Hi there. Good to have you. Um, my, mine's kind of on the other side of it. Um, I was in a park here in Cabbage Town, just there, you know, in the middle between St. James Town and uh, Regent Park. Right. And I and I and I was witness to these, you know, these sort of in, a, in the middle of the day, two two different kind of gangs <clears throat> had had a verbal exchange. One made, pretended that or made out like he he was carrying a weapon. The other people that happened to be around the park left because they got a little nervous. I hang around, and about within 10 minutes, some bicycle police, police on bicycles came up, and, you know, within moments they had these, it was like a scene from cops or whatever, they had these these four guys on the ground and cuffed and with the guns right at their head. In the meantime, some other individual who's across the park who didn't hear the exchange, who didn't see all this, He's coming across with his camera, his, t- his phone camera, and he's taking all these pictures. And you know, he's he's talking about, you know, how they're uh, harassing these poor, innocent little teenagers. So, and so here you you got about thirty seconds. Just wrap it up. And, your your and point so is. My, so my issue is that you know I think maybe there's a fear too with the police that you know their their actions can get construed the wrong way because of people who, um, you know, don't don't. Don't really understand what's yeah, going kind on. Of, and they're kind of baited. Yeah, they're kind of baited and tricked in this instance that he describes. Yeah. It sure sounds like Ross. Uh, you want to comment on that? Yeah, CCTV. You have to know how to use it and uh, video properly because you know what? If you don't catch the thing that happens just before the thing just after, you can absolutely draw the wrong conclusions from looking at something. However, the CCTV does help to at least nail down some of the facts. You know, in the States, Joe, a lot of the cops now are wearing uh, cameras right on their lapels, and they have to turn them on whenever they're interacting with people. That's interesting. Thank you for the call. Let's take a break. You're listening to In-Depth Radio News Talk 1010. Oh, be still, my beating heart. Who was that? I don't know who that was. 416-872-1010, 416-872-1010, Star Talk, 8255-71010, long distance one 5151 Nick, downtown, you're on with the Scrawler and Ross McLean. Hi, guys. Uh, I just I, I just had to call in because I, I can't believe the level of ignorance out there um, of people who want to blame somebody else for, for all these, these uh, people doing harm in our community, you, you know, like Rob Ford wanting to, to send uh, people out of the city who have been committed to a gun crime. The people in our community are our responsibility. They're a product of the decisions that we have all made collectively, You're right. whether it's through our government or whether it's through us as, as individuals on the street. You know, when was the last time that somebody said hi to you walking down the street? You know, we, we are... And, we are responsible for ourselves, and we cannot um, uh, keep on, and we have been doing this for my entire lifetime anyway, putting off um, the realities of, of society in, in Canada, which, which is the, um, it, it's all about socioeconomics, which is all about uh, mental health. Now, we've, we've, we've started to look at mental health. We're, we're, we're going backwards when it comes to socioeconomics. Uh, where where the discrepancies are becoming wider and wider, and uh, and and people want to just ship off people, uh, their okay. brothers and their sisters Thank and you. their and their sons and daughters because they did something bad, which we were a part of, and we have to take responsibility of that. And everybody and everyone I'm listening to tonight does not want to. All well, the callers you know, that have come in. 
There, there are some that do, some that do this, some that don't. But well said, Nick. Thank you very much for the call. Let's go to uh, Roxanne in Toronto. Welcome to the Late Shift. Hi. Um, I was just listening, and I wanted to comment that I was a Canadian living in Los Angeles um, in the 1980s, so before the whole Simpson thing. And they had a big police problem. They thought they had a police problem, but it went all the way through judges and all the way to the top. And I just feel like that's happening here. I just see it. Well, we had, uh, you know what, I don't know whether that's happening here or not. It certainly has been proven in a court that it's happening here. We did have police officers uh, before the courts in a drug situation, and, you know, basically all the serious charges were thrown out. There were some minor ones, uh, and it took a long time to to do it. What do you think, Ross, of what she's uh, alluding to? Uh, Well, I think she's making the point that... uh we're slowly becoming uh, like an American city that we don't right. want to become. And it's certainly all the all the telltale signs are there that are a lot like Los Angeles. Why it's, is it, and Roxanne, but, I'd like to just get your thoughts on this, because you lived in Los Angeles. Why are people okay with us having 60, 70, 80 murders? And that it's kind of like, oh, well, it's, it's... Even the chief, there's a quote in uh, Don Pete's story here tonight from the chief, and he says that they, you know, after Danzig, uh, they... You know, took action and they didn't have a murder for seven weeks. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but he said that. And he said that's quite a remarkable achievement. I mean, remarkable for who? Oh. Remarkable for the Yase family? I mean, I, they're, are they going to be jumping up and down, and excited yeah. that we didn't have a murder for a number of weeks? So you see yeah. that the there seems to be a disconnect that well, when you have sixty or seventy homicides, you got hundreds of shootings and. And you've got, you know, we haven't talked about the stabbings all day long, sexual assaults. If you read the majors, they go on and on and on, all the stalkings, all the people mm-hmm. being robbed on the TTC. We had the great, um, the horrible situation, the latest sexual assault. I mean, this city has got it all. And yet, you know, and I'm not saying that people aren't taking it seriously, but are we becoming complacent? It's, it's almost a matter of the police. And I like the way you, um, your phrase is catch and release. The, the police are sort of, they, even if they go out and get them, you know, there's no, nothing will ever come of it. No. So, and that's the same exact thing they had in Los Angeles, except they had some rogue, uh, you, you know what, see, they, but, we- Thank you for the call, Roxanne. We're going to, have to okay. take some more calls. I appreciate her call. You know, Stephen Skirka, who does the closing argument show here on Sunday on News Talk 1010, was on with John Tory earlier, and he raised an excellent point. And we do have to be careful because these people need to be proven guilty in a court of law. And the, you know, one of the callers that didn't hang around before Ross mentioned about our snitch line or my snitch line idea is that who's to say that someone can't call in with information that's not accurate about somebody? And so we have to be careful that we don't convict people before they're uh, guilty in the court of law. The point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, for the community to stand up and say that person did it, they need to see a hell of a lot more from the premier on down before they're going to stick their neck out. Kenneth Mark did, and he's dead. Kelly and Mississauga, welcome to the late shift. Hi, how are you tonight? Oh, uh, doing great. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm. As you can probably tell, earlier the first hour. I was very, very upset. I was surprised at my own emotion on it, but I'm just sick and tired of people trying to uh, push this off as not a real problem when it is. I I totally agree, but I think this onion has to be peeled back to the core. You have to look at the criminal code, and in particular with some of these gang mem- members, they're protected through the Young Offenders Act, and it is a catch and release. It's a slap on the wrist if they haven't been caught doing anything before, and it just continues to trickle down. And, you know, some of these kids have a rap sheet a mile long by the time they hit 18 and it's gone. You know, you know Kel- Kel- and- Kelly, you're, you're absolutely right on that. That's where I was pretty well, I was pretty ticked off when the premier came with the solicitor's attorney general and they came out with none of the ideas about the things that you're talking about. No, no, here's Kelly. I don't know. Are you a mom, Kelly? I am a mother of four. A mother of four. And, you know, she's raised four kids, or she's raising four kids. And, uh, and you know, the Young Offenders Act, I mean, there's so many, uh, 
you know, we talk about it year after year after year. Every time we do a show on crime, it comes up. And in, in these I, cases here, these this case that I talked about, Kelly, of the guy Kenneth Mark that was uh, killed for daring to tell the truth on the stand, mm-hmm. he was killed by a young offender who only got six years. Exactly. And and that and that's the problem. The politicians need to look at the the huge, significant gray areas in the criminal code in that in that Young Offenders Act, where the criminal is being protected by our government and the victims are being lost in the wash. Well, good call, Ross. That's, you know what? She just she just said it all right there. The Thank victims are being lost and the criminals are getting the breaks. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate the call, Roger in Etobicoke. Welcome to the Late Shift. Hey, yeah, good topic. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I just, I just like to say that uh, um, you know there should be more police presence and it, it randomized timing in, in in going into these locations uh, uh, of all of the areas that that are causing the problem. They're well known by the police, and, and I'm assuming a, a lot of the people as to where these bad areas are. Strong police uh, presence with a strong arm, not going in there handshaking. Because what they do is they get the attention of the police that are there, and and while the police have uh, their attention on something else, they're doing things right behind their back, 20 feet away from them. Also, the video surveillance. The, the surveillance around uh, uh, the areas which are the problem areas, a lot of them don't work. They've been spray-painted over to test to see if they do work, because if they do work, somebody will go there and replace whatever's broken on it or whatever the case they're taken out with basketballs so that uh, you know no no, no uh, video can be taken. If they're put behind somewhere in a wall on a flat surface behind bulletproof glass or something of that nature where they can't be tampered with, uh, which I'm sure you know modern technology you can do that very easily, and and uh, have these cameras in working condition. Well, that's a good good excellent point. Let's play a clip here, Roger, uh, from Mike McCormick on your point. What it is is that these uh, gunmen and stuff, they victimize the whole community. And the community, it's not, it's not uh, primarily to do with any police community relationships. It's got to do with, the, you know, the people who live in those communities who are terrorized. These gunmen make no bones about it that they will terrorize and victimize anybody. And one of the things that Mike McCormick uh, Ross said uh, today to Jerry Agar here on News Talk 1010 is that with all the talk about cutting police officers, and as Roger's point is that we need more police presence, I know it's not a simple solution. Uh, you say, well, we want more police over here and less there and, and all that. But, you know, Mike does raise a point that, and you've seen the proof of it, when you invest in it, you have people working overtime like they did, uh, there were, as the chief is right, there were less uh, incidents. If you're deployed right and you uh, do it right, you can you can squash all these. These problems are not unstoppable, uh, not at all. And and Roger ra- raises a great point. The part that bothers me about the way we police these housing projects is we wait for a call after something's already happened, then we rush in, put a chalk outline around the body, and ask people to be witnesses. And we've been doing that now for like ten years. Uh, th- this responding after the fact is not working. We need to be proactive. Uh, with a permanent police presence in these areas. Uh, how do you do a permanent police residence? Do you take an apartment uh, in, in the TCHC, the bigger complexes, and say this is now a police station right inside there? You go drop a trailer right in the middle of the parking lot, and you make that a police station that you work out of, that police are in 24-7. I would look at taking over the apartments right beside the elevators or right beside, beside the entrances, and I would put police in there. 24-7, who would sit there and get to know all the people. I'd take police, I'd put them at a gatehouse on the way into many of these projects. And undercover too. Yeah, the undercover, everything. And let people know that no, we are not leaving, we're going to be here, and we're going to watch you. It's the only way you're going to solve this problem. You can't go in and uh, only respond when there's a problem. We need, uh, in warfare terms, they call this a counterinsurgency is what you're doing. And that costs money. It costs money, but it costs money for what we're doing right now. Well, thank you, Roger, for the call. I hope that uh, worker. I, I hope that helps, Roger. Uh, let's uh, take a call here from Mike in Hamilton. Welcome to the Late Shift. Hi, Joe. I... Did you hear any of that? I lost him. Did we lose him? Okay, sorry, Mike. You want to try call back, Gary? Uh, last call before we take a break to you. Hey, Gary. Yeah, you're there. Yeah, something that always puzzled me. 
in, I, I lived in 31 Division for a long time, and for about 15 years, they had this thing for about anywhere from 8 to 12 Mounties would report to, uh, uniform Mounties would report to 31 Division, and for about two or three weeks, they'd ride around with Metro Cops. I think they called it the Urban Immersion Program. And then all of a sudden, Jordan Manners got shot, and with about three days, the program was just canceled, and I've never seen I've never seen the Mounties riding with the Toronto cops ever again. I'm thinking, if you have twelve Mounties, you're putting twelve scout cars on for the price of six. What, well, Ross, why, any thoughts on that? Oh, I'm yeah. not sure what the purpose of the program was or how it was working. Was it something you're saying was working? Oh yeah, it had for about fifteen years. Like there were Mounties from like all across the provinces. They didn't have any city experience. So well, they'd well, there's, the there's, conference for two or three weeks. Yeah, we'll have to look. We'll look into it, and we'll <laughs> maybe next week. And you do some looking into it as well, and we'll get back to you on it. Thank you, Gary. I'll check. I'll check it out further, Joe. Good, Th- good program. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Thank you very much. You're listening to the Late Shift on In Depth Radio News Talk 1010. There was so much uh, great radio here on News Talk 1010 today, and we played uh, all of it before. Obviously the. Uh, John Moore's uh, f- uh, first round table, uh, I thought was excellent, and then uh, Dave Agar's uh, comments. And one of the things that really stood out for me today was Amber Giro, one of the reporters here, and her report. And Justin's uh, queued it up for us. But I can tell you, these guys have been going at it since before I was in high school. And uh, the situation was so bad at times because they were basically, if you were young and black and were not a recognized face in their neighborhood on their turf, they would open fire. And it got to a uh, time where uh, even my family members were telling uh, my my cousin, a young black man at the time, you know, don't be driving in these areas at night because you never know who's going to be around and who's going to mistake you for someone else or a rival gang member. So it, it just goes to show these are gangs that keep popping up you got the young ones who come in they work their way up you got the older ones who come back on the street hardened and more determined than ever uh, to take back their turf uh, excellent uh, points that amber giro raised uh, she grew up in this area and obviously her perspective is important and there's lots of uh, people like amber that grew up in neighborhoods like this and go on to be uh, very successful as amber is you don't have to become a gangbanger, and I think that's the point. I mean, I think that they really are, they should be ostracized, on, and maybe in some cases get at them earlier, um, but it, it proves it right there. And her point is that, you know, it's not, it wasn't safe uh, to go into certain areas. How could that be? In our city, everywhere should be safe. Well, that's why we need to take a look at this, and it's time to start changing the way that we deal with this, Joe. You know, the thought occurred to me as I listened to Amber talking about growing up in the neighborhood and what she saw and how it went on, I almost thought, imagine if they just had a yearbook for each one of these little places, each one of these housing projects where they put the pictures in. You can go back and look. I mean, how many kids are going to have what their ambition is going to be and what they're going to be, but how many end up getting crossed off later on as in jail or dead? You know, just too many of them, Joe. And it's a disgrace for all of us, and it's everyone's fault. And yes, I was pretty ticked off about things today, but it really is a cross-the-spectrum problem, not just you know, criticizing the police officers, because that's not really fair. I think what I was trying to point out there earlier was the fact that if they don't have an answer for it, don't dump it onto people that you're not going to protect. Well, I think the police, um, there's a percentage of them that understand what they're doing is not working, and there's a percentage of them that don't like how it's being handled, and I'm sure there's ones who want to try something different and suggest something different. I mean, there are a core member of... uh, of uh, coppers on the force, Joe, who do really care. They do. Let's play a clip uh, from the news conference today. These shooters are small, weak, and cowardly. And the fact is uh, that because of their propensity for violence and their willingness to to shoot guns, they've got the community holding back. Let's play it one more time. These shooters are small, weak, and cowardly. And the fact is... uh, that because of their propensity for violence and their willingness to, to shoot guns, they've got the community holding back. No, small, weak, and cowardly. When they hear that, and, you know, I mean, how are they going to react to it? I mean, they're listening. They're, they're, they're laughing about it because they understand 
that the police aren't going to have any witnesses. They'll never get them convicted. I mean, I mean, that's what they're laughing about. They're laughing because they can't get convicted with this joke. It's really something. It's a very sad state of affairs, uh, particularly, you know, when I was at that news conference and I saw uh, Chief, uh, Deputy Chief and now Chief McGuire say that, you know, one idiot with a gun does not, uh, you know, I can't remember oh. how he said it, but the state of affairs for Toronto, and he was wrong. And a lot of people misled the city along the way, and, you know, they know even today when they linked all these shootings all the way back to 2011, and they go back before that. Um, you know, as you said, the, the public's not buying the, the bill of goods anymore. No, they're not. And they're seeing that they're not getting the solutions to it. You know, they need to do some innovative things. They need to get this witness protection program ramped up incredible. They need to be offering big cash rewards for evidence right away as soon as one of these shootings goes on. And they need to start occupying these housing projects. At least pick one. Pick one and just do that. 24-7 police presence in that project until you clean it up. How many people were at the Danzig uh, barbecue that believed McGuire and thought, you know what, I'm safe here with my kids. There's not really a gang problem. And, you know, I, I just wonder that, you know, I, again, we don't want to say that the sky is falling, as the caller that upset me before uh, said, but, and I don't think that we're doing that. I think we're talking about things in real terms. Hey, Joe, it's time to call it the way it's happening. And listen, I, I encourage people next time they see pictures of any of these housing projects or they watch the video on TV, watch what everybody's wearing in the, in, in the, in the pictures. You look at Danzig, everybody, everybody's wearing light Crips blue. Everybody. The kids, they're little blue backpacks. Go look at the uh, other projects where it's Bloods, everybody's wearing red. The kids know that from the time they're little, Joe, five years old. They know the colors they're supposed to wear. And what about the, uh, you know, the tagging, the tagging, the graffiti? The tagging was, uh, you know, the really, what was the 13? Uh... Yeah, MS-13. You know, people miss a lot of this stuff about the tagging in gangs. And anybody who was down in Los Angeles before, like the other caller talked about, the tagging all has symbols and it means something. You know, these gangsters also have uh, hand signals they use to give each other. The one guy was talking about the people in the park. Well, gangsters have a way of signaling whether they're heavy or not, whether they're carrying guns or not to each other. Wow. Well, listen, Ross McLean, it's really great that you came in to help us through this difficult night, and thank you to all the great callers. It was incredible, wasn't it? I mean, just Some tremendous you know, callers. great callers. They, they're picking up the nuances behind us. And everybody here at News Talk 10, thank you very much. And all the listeners, we'll see you on the Late Shift next week. Thank you, Justin, as well. Now time for news. Scrawler out.